Okay, so let's start. Uh, <clears throat> I'd like to thank you again, Avelino. I can't be thankful in enough for what you're doing. Believe me, you have no idea what it means to us, not to me, but what it means to us to have you having these lectures, uh, giving these lectures to thank all you. of us. I mean, it's a, it's, a, it's a blast in disguise. I mean, because having someone to give, who's an expert in the field and who is super familiar with the code explaining the nuances of the code and so on man is I, I can't thank you enough for that i really hope that i can repay you someday because <clears throat> i'm really thankful for <laughs> everything you've been doing so uh <clears throat> i thank already you. explained them that i asked you to do a recap i mean it doesn't matter how much time you take to this recap of previous lecture but Take your time and thank you again for for everything. Okay, so well, thank you for the introduction. It's my pleasure to be with you guys. So I'm really having a good time and I really enjoy discussing with you about these tools, which are so useful. So there's no need for for a repayment, but thank you anyway. <laughs> um, so yes, I will start with a little recap of what I said yesterday. In particular, well, let me share my screen because otherwise I will forget. Yeah, okay. So I will tell you a little bit about the connection between SAR and Sphino that I discussed yesterday, because I think this is one of the most important things of these uh, two tools, that you can combine them together. So in the first lecture, we saw how to use SARA for analytical calculations, how to get mass matrices, vertices, uh, renormalization group equations, and other kinds of uh, information about the model, uh, all of it analytical. And in the second lecture, we saw how to use Sphino to calculate numerical things about the same model um, in, a, in an efficient way and in a very easy way. But the important thing is that these two codes are connected. So with the Sphino, you can do many calculations, but for a very uh, limited number of models. So you can do them for the minimal supersymmetric standard model and some other uh, supersymmetric models, but not for any model that you can imagine. So the nice thing about this connection is that you can define your model in SARA, do all the analytical calculations that you need, all the calculations that you want, and then for the numerical calculations, you can pass that information to Sphino and, and then use the mathematical uh, routines that are already implemented in Sphino, such as the analyzation of uh, mass matrices, um, resolution of differential equations, and so on, which are already implemented in the code, but can be, can be applied to your specific model. And I think that's very important. And so telling you a bit more about Sphino, so this is a Fortran code. So Fortran is a language that was used long ago for numerical calculations. It's not as popular nowadays as Python or C++, but for people doing numerical calculations, it is very well known as a reliable uh, programming language. And so Sphino is written in Fortran, as I said, and Sphino was originally uh, created by Bernard Porot. And more recently, in the last few years, also has important contributions from Florian Stau, which, uh, as you know, is the, the creator of uh, SARA. So together, they worked into the integration of these two tools into a single one. You can find uh, the code here. You can download it and, and compile it. And so what we saw yesterday and what we are going to do again today is to show how to create first routines for your particular model with SARA, how to pass that information to Sphino, then compile everything together so that you have a code that gives you numerical results for your particular model. So we did that yesterday for the scotogenic model. And the plan of today is to do it again, all of it. So just go from the start, from the first lecture to what we did yesterday for a different model. A model that is a little bit less trivial. It contains uh, a few additional ingredients with respect to the scotogenic model, and that will allow you to get more confident about these tools and also to understand what are the differences that you may find in practical uh, applications, in practical implementations of your own models. Okay? If, it, if, there, if there is any question about uh, the Sphino uh, and the lecture we had yesterday, I think this is a good moment before I tell you about the new model that we're going to consider today. Okay, 
then let me uh, continue with the with the model that I would like to tell you about today. So I have this in a different presentation. Okay. So I call this final exercise, even though it's not really an exercise. Um, but it, as you will see, it's just a repetition of what we just did in the in the first two lectures. But now we're going to use this model. Okay. This is not as popular as the scotogenic model. This is a model that I proposed together with uh, Diego Aristizabal and, and Florian Stau back in 2015. And it's actually a very simple model. So you will understand it very easily. So we have the standard model gauge group and we extend it with an additional U1. So now we have SU3 color, SU2 left, U1 hyperchar times U1, we call it X. So some additional U1 gauge. So this is a gauge group as well. And we have some additional leptons some additional quarks, and some additional scalars. Um, the quarks and leptons, they, are, they come in vector-like uh, pairs. So we have, as you can see, you have a guy that is like the, the quark doublet in the standard model with exactly the same quantum numbers under the standard model gauge group, but in addition, it's charged under U1x. So this two here corresponds to the charge under U1x. The standard model quark doublet is not charged, so has a zero here. This is the difference. The second difference is that this guy is vector-like. Vector-like means that the left-handed and the right-handed components have exactly the same representation, and therefore you are allowed to write uh, a Dirac mass term in the Lagrange, because that would be gauge invariant. Exactly the same for the leptons. So we have, again, a pair of vector-like leptons with exactly the same numbers under the standard model gauge group as the lepton doublet in the standard model, but also additionally with a charge under U1x, okay? And again, this is vector-like, meaning that left-handed and right-handed components have exactly the same representation. And then this additional U1x comes with a gauge boson, and that gauge boson would be massless if we don't break the symmetry. For this reason, we need an additional scalar that will have a bef. This scalar is a singlet of everything but the U1x symmetry. So when this guy gets a bef, this guy will break U1x and will give a mass to the additional gauge boson that comes from this group. And finally, we have an additional scalar that is actually um, an ingredient if you want to have a dark matter candidate. You will see that in a moment. It's also a singlet under everything but U1x. Okay? So with this, we are allowed to write some additional terms in the Lagrangian. So as I said before, since these guys are vector-like, you can write a Dirac mass term for the vector-like quarks and a vector-like mass, a Dirac mass uh, term for the uh, vector-like leptons. And also, you can have this type of Yukawa interactions. So this is, for example, a Yukawa interaction between the standard model quark tablet, the new quark tablet that we have introduced, thanks to this phi uh, scalar that we have here. So you can see that all the charges, all the representations are correct, and this guy is gauge invariant. And this comes with a, a new vector, lambda q, which is a vector because we have three, uh, three families here and one family here. So this guy actually has three numbers inside, three components. And next, we can do exactly the same but with the leptons. So again, we have a new Yukawa coupling, which is a Yukawa vector actually with three components that couple the vector-like fermions with the standard model fermions. And this is very important because after symmetry breaking, when this guy phi gets a bef, all these terms will induce a mixing between the standard model fermions that are here and the, the new vector-like fermions that are here. So we will have an extended mass matrix that will include the standard model fermions, but also the new fermions that come in these representations. You will see that in a moment with Sarah. Okay, so symmetry breaking takes place in this way. We have a bef of the standard model Higgs that will break the electroweak symmetry, and then we will have a bef of the new scalar that will break U1x. Because of this BEF, you get a, a massive uh, gauge boson that we will call Z prime, which is the standard way to denote this neutral gauge boson, which uh, has a mass which is proportional to the gauge capping of the U1x uh, gauge uh, symmetry and this BEF in exactly this way. And finally, um, it is interesting that in this model you have this guy, Kai. I remind you, it's this scalar. But due to this particular choice for the charge under U1x, it's only allowed to have 
terms in the scalar potential that are either quadratic or quartic in the field. That means that automatically, even though U1x is going to be broken by these beds, there will be a re remnant set to symmetry in the, in the Lagrangian. So even without uh, an additional symmetry, we will have a dark matter candidate because this guy will be stable. Uh, so this is what I wanted to tell you about the model. But yesterday, no, sorry, not yesterday, two days ago, we had a question about U1 mixing. So it may well happen uh, that if you don't uh, take care, you get terms in your Lagrangian like this, and these are super dangerous, because as you know very well, probably much better than I do, the phenomenology of these couplings that are gauge invariant, when you have two U1 uh, groups in your, in your gauge group, uh, tells you that this coupling here has to be very small. Because otherwise, uh, you basically mix the photon with the additional gauge boson coming from this symmetry. Um, as you know, the standard way to describe this mixing is with this epsilon coupling that goes in front of this uh, L mu, L mu uh, term in the, in the Lagrangian. But in SARA, uh, this is done differently for practical reasons. So the way this is done is by constructing a matrix of, of gauge couplings. So you have G1, that is the, the coupling for the G1 hypercharge uh, group. You have Gx, which is the coupling for, for this group, for the U1x group. And you have this uh, off the diagonal couplings, which somehow, and I don't have the analytical expression, but they are directly connected to epsilon. They, there is a one-to-one -one relation between epsilon and these two quantities. They basically describe this U1 mixing. Um, in, in practice, this means that you don't have to care about this mixing because it's already implemented in the model. It's just additional parameters. So you will have two additional parameters, G1x and Gx1, that you will have in your Lagrangian, even though you don't need to define them. Just because it's gauge invariant, it's allowed to be there by all symmetries. Okay, so this is something that I wanted to say because that was uh, mentioned in the first lecture. Sorry. <clears throat> okay, so with this, um, I'm done about explaining the model. If you have any comment or question, the model has some motivation from some flavor anomalies, but I think this is not relevant for the discussion, not relevant for, for today's lecture. Um, what is important is that you have an additional U1 group with some additional fields and some additional Lagrangian terms. That's it. And you will see how that translates into, into the uh, implementation in SARA. Okay. You will see that there will be some additional things. Avelin, I do have one. So could you go back one slide? Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, uh, no, the one with the kinetic mixing. Mm. Okay. Um, yeah, that one, I think. Okay, so you say this GX is the one for the U1 gauge symmetry, and uh, yes. GX, what is GX1? So these two guys are... Um, Somehow already you, uh, extracted from Sarah? Yeah, these two guys are epsilon. So, technically speaking, I think they are the coefficients of... Uh, uh, I'm not sure how this is implemented internally in Sarah, but I think it's somehow some sort of off-diagonal term in the covariant derivative. Mm. That can be viewed as an alternative way to parameterize this epsilon term. Mm -hmm. I see. Okay, so even if, even if you haven't included at first... It will generate anyways just because it's allowed. Exactly, exactly. I see. So then you have to tune your couplings to make sure that epsilon is, is set is zero. I mean, can I take this GX1 and then put it zero and then I'm done? Exactly. This is what we're going to do. So okay, I see. Uh, at the level of the Lagrangian, it will be present. But then for the numerical application, we will set it to zero and then we can forget about it. Okay, all right. Okay, or, or you can set it to any value, but then you have control. You can completely control it. Uh, I believe, uh, mm -hmm. G1 and GX are the gauge couplings that appear in the Lagrangian, right? Mm -hmm. And only G1X is is not directly in the Lagrangian. You have to relate it somehow with Edson. Exactly. Well, it's in the Lagrangian. It, it, it's just a different... I don't have the analytical expression, but you can see... I mean, this is epsilon times FF, 
and and you can make a, a I think you can just make a gauge transformation that allows you to rewrite epsilon ff in a way that allows you to identify some of the diagonal gauge coupling in the covariant derivatives. Yes, yes. All right, all right. So it's just a different parameterization of the same physics. This is more common, and I think it's also more elegant because you just have one parameter. But this is alternative, and, and this is the way it's done in, in SARA. Okay, I don't have, unfortunately, I don't have the exact uh, analytical relation between this epsilon and this of diagonal couplings. Since we are going to have them equal to zero, then it doesn't matter, because, of course, when this is zero, this is zero as well. But if you wanted to have a specific value, we would have to make sure that we understand correctly what is the relation. Okay, so with this, I'm done discussing the, the model. So let me show you how to implement this model in SARA. So I also provide the implementation in a file that you can find in the in the website. It's here in this dark BS uh, file. So let me go to SARA, models, and do exactly what we did in case of the scotogenic model. So we'll create a new folder that I call dark BS, which is the name of the model. I then go inside. I copy that file, I think it's here, yes it is, okay, and then I untap the file, okay, and then I'm done, I have all the model files for this particular model. I can now open the main model file because this is the one, as you know, with the most important information about the model. And um, here it is. Okay, so there are things that you already know. You are already familiar with these things because we saw them in the first lecture. So let me just point out what are the main differences, the most important differences with respect to the to the implementation of the scotogenic model. And you will see that you already understand most of it. So again, we begin with this uh, general information about the model. Then we have the global symmetry of the model, this set two that we have. And then we have the gauge groups. And here you see that we have again the first three gauge groups, which are exactly the same as in the standard model and also as in the scotogenic model. But then we have an additional gauge group, which is this U1X that we have introduced. So we have to give a name to the new gauge boson. We call it PP. So something like P prime. Uh, the group is U1. This is the name we give to the group. This is just a label. There is no information here, it's just a label. The gauge coupling is called GX. Uh, false means that we don't want to expand in gauge indices, even though in this case it doesn't matter because it's just U1, so there are no indices. And finally, 1 refers to this set to symmetry here. So the gauge boson that belongs to this group is plus 1 under the set 2. And that's it. Now we have again the fermion fields in the standard model that now have an additional entry. This entry wasn't there yesterday. It wasn't there for the scotogenic model because this U1 group is not in the scotogenic model. So for example, let's go to this, uh, this field here. This is the quark doublet of the standard model. This is the name. This is the number of copies. These are the names for the two SU2 components. This is the U1 hypercharge, a doublet of SU2, a triplet of SU3, and then it comes a zero. A zero meaning that there is zero charge under the fourth gauge group. So this guy doesn't have a charge under U1X. And finally, the last entry refers to the global symmetry, to the set two. Okay? And we do exactly the same with the others. So you see that the lepton doublet, again, is like the lepton doublet in the standard model, but with an extra zero here because it doesn't have a charge under U1X. Now we have these four guys, which are new. These are the vector-like leptons and quarks. And now, you probably remember that in the first lecture I discussed a little bit in detail the fact that in SARA, all the fermions have to be left-handed. All the, the fermions in the implementation have to be left-handed. What that means is that this guy here, okay, this guy corresponds exactly to, let me go to the slide, corresponds exactly to L, okay? This guy here is L. 
Or to be more precise, this guy here, let me put it back, uh -huh, this guy here is the left-handed component of L. However, this guy here is not the right-handed component directly because, as I said, all the guys here have to be left-handed. So what this guy is, is the conjugate of the right-handed component to make it left-handed. So even though the label says LR, this is not right-handed, but it's actually left-handed. It's the conjugate of the right-handed. And because of this conjugation, you see that all charges are opposite. So instead of minus one half, it has to be plus one half because there is a conjugation. And instead of two, it has to be minus two and then you one X. Okay? For the doublet and the, and the singlet and the uh, SU3, this doesn't change anything because you know that two and two bar in SU2 is the same. But for these hypercharges, this is important. And we do exactly the same with the quarks, okay? So we have the, the new Q left, which is not, be careful, eh? this is not this field. It's a different field, which is also charged under U1X. And we have Q right, which again, I repeat, is not actually right-handed, but it's actually the conjugate of the right-handed component. And in this case, we also have to add a minus here, because for SU3, you know very well that uh, 3 and 3 bar are not exactly the same representation. They are different. Okay, uh, one more thing is that we have, for these guys, since all of them are doublets of SU2, we have to give names to the components, to the SU2 components. So we decided to use these names, which are just labels. So you can use any name that you want here. Finally, we have the new scalars. Well, first we have the, the scalar we had already in the scogenic model, and also in the standard model, this is the Higgs doublet, and the two additional guys. So this is five. And this is chi. For phi, you see that this is a zero hypercharge, singlet of SU2, singlet of SU3, and charge plus 2, under U1X, and uh, charge plus 1, under the set 2. Whereas for chi, we have zero hypercharge, singlet of SU2, singlet of SU3, charge minus 1, under U1X, and charge minus 1, under set 2. So I think this is more or less easy to understand after what we did in the first lecture. Okay, let me continue. This is the definition of the Lagrangian. In this case, I decided to do it in two pieces. So I have a first piece here. Oh, let me jump a line so that you can see the difference better. So in this, um, in this part of the Lagrangian, we have uh, the part of the Lagrangian for which you don't need to add the Hermitian conjugate. So you, you see it here. So for this part of the Lagrangian, add Hermitian conjugate is set to false. Because these terms, all of them are self-Hermitian. You don't need to add anything else. And there is a second part, given here, in which we have add Hermitian conjugate true. And you can see the terms. They are very easy to understand, again, after what we did in the first lecture. For example, so these terms here corresponds to the vector-like masses for the vector-like quarks and leptons. So this is the vector-like mass for the vector-like quarks which is gauge invariant because left and right have exactly the same representation. And this is a vector-like mass for the vector-like leptons. And again, this is gauge invariant. And finally, we have these Yukawa couplings between phi, which is the new scalar, the standard model quarks, and the new quarks, and phi, the standard model leptons, and the new leptons. I think this is very much easy, right, after the first discussion, the first lecture. Okay, let me continue. This is the definition of the mixes in the gauge sector. We see, you see again that we go again step by step through the same uh, steps that we did for the scotogenic model. We just have to see that there are some minor differences. In this case, you can see a difference in this line. Now we have three neutral gauge portions and not just two. So we have to reflect it somehow in the implementation. And this is what we do here. So we have the B boson the W3, and the new B prime. So this B prime is the guy that we have defined here, okay, with the V in front of it to make explicit that this is a vector. Okay, and these three guys, they mix, resulting in three mass eigenstates, which are the photon, the set boson, and a new set prime. And this set set is the name of the mixing matrix, which will be three times three, not just two times two, as it is in the scotogenic model, so a bit larger. 
I think everything is clear so far, right? So you don't have any comments or questions. Okay. Okay, so now we come to the BEVs, the definition of the vacuum expectation values. First, we have the definition for H0. Okay? So H0 is the standard, uh, the neutral component of the standard model Higgs doublet. And we define it as V plus sigma H plus phi H with these prefactors. 1 over the square root of 2, I divided by square root of 2, and 1 over the square root of 2. Okay? So basically, we are splitting the field in terms of a BEV, a, a real part, and an imaginary part. And we do exactly the same, no difference at all, with phi. We have also a BEV, a, an imaginary part, and a real part. Now, uh, again, for practical reasons, for simplicity, I'm going to assume that there is no CP violation, at least no CP violation in the scalar sector, and that implies that these guys, these sigmas, which are the imaginary components, they mix among themselves, but they don't mix with the real components. Okay? And similarly, the neutral components, these files, they mix among themselves, but they don't mix with the sigmas. And this is reflected here. So you probably remember that in the scotogenic model, we didn't have mixing among scalars. But in this case, we do. So you, you see in the first line that I'm defining a mixing between phi h and phi p. So the real components of phi, of h0 and phi. Okay? The mass eigenstates will be denoted as HH, and the mixing matrix, which will be 2 times 2, very simple mixing matrix, will be uh, defined in this way, ZH. This is the name for the, for the mixing matrix. And we do exactly the same for the CP odd scalars, so for the imaginary components. Sigma H and Sigma P. They will mix, resulting in this mass eigenstates with this mixing matrix. Avelina, sorry. Uh, yes. The definition of the mass eigenstates of these scalars uh, seems to be different from the ones of the, the vector bosons. Uh, uh, in the vector boson case, uh, you have the specific names of the three uh, vector bosons, the mass eigenstates, and in the scalar case you have only one name, apparently, for the two mass eigenstates, right? Yes, yes, you are completely right. Yeah, uh, it, 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 is this optional or uh, it has to mm. be this? It this has way? to be like this. It, it has to be like this. The, the reason is that, um, so in Sara and also in Isfino, for physical reasons, so they wanted to have some identification of the photon and the cell boson. Uh, so, if you had here like a long family, like uh, I don't know, something like this, like P neutral, something, no? similar notation, this would be the same notation. The problem is that the photon would be Vn1, the set boson would be Vn2, and so on. So, that doesn't isolate somehow the special role played by the photon and the special role played by the set boson. For that reason, uh, I think uh, the creators of SARA decided to, um, sorry, I'm here. Yes, they decided to identify, to single out the different gauge bosons. Okay. However, for the scalars, I mean, in many models you will have many scalars. Imagine a model with uh, four Higgs doublets and two singlets. In that case, you will have maybe six, seven states. And, and for that reason, maybe giving a particular name for each of them would be a little bit cumbersome, a lot of work. And in this way, it's just H to H, one, two, three, and just a generation index. Yes, okay. But it, it's just a practical choice by the creators. Of course, there is no physics behind, uh, more than the fact that, I mean, photon is special, the set boson is special, because we have yeah. measured <coughs> their couplings, Okay, so it's a practical reason. Okay. Okay, uh, well, for the fermions, we do exactly the same as we did yesterday. Now, you have to see that, that in addition, yesterday we had this. Okay, this is what we had yesterday. Now, in addition of the standard model field, we have to remember that 
that is mixing with the additional fermions that we have added. So D4 and D5 are the components of QL and QRight of that type. Okay? And you can see that they are exchanged. So this is QD and this is TU because, as I told you before, this is the conjugate field of a left hand, uh, sorry, a right handed component. And for that reason, up and down are exchanged. As, as you know well, this is a standard rule. Okay? So what I'm saying here in these lines is that D4 and D5, they mix with the standard model fermions, resulting in a more, uh, a larger uh, set of uh, mass eigenstates, capital DL and capital DR. Okay? And we do exactly the same with the upwards, and we do exactly the same with the charge leptons. And also for the neutrinos, we have the three normal, let's say, neutrinos that we have in the standard model lepton doublets, and we have two additional neutrinos coming, again, from the new vector like leptons, okay, B4 and B5. It's exactly the same, the same thing that we have for the uh, quarks and, and charge leptons, but for the neutrinos. With the only difference that the neutrinos, uh, they are Majorana fermions, they don't have right-handed components, and for that reason, they are all left-handed. We have a specific uh, syntaxes to specify this mixing. So we don't have to differentiate between left-handed and right-handed components, but we have just all of them together. Okay? And this is what we did yesterday also. With the, sorry, not yesterday, in the first lecture. Uh, with the neutrinos. So there is no difference. And finally, we have to define direct spinners, and you can see that this is actually an exact repetition of what we had for the scotogenic model. So the definition of the direct spinners is exactly the same. So you see, in, once you learn the basic technique to implement a model, all you have to care about is the minor difference between a model and that you have implemented already and the new one. The rest is basically the same, with very, very few modifications. If you have a very complicated model, then of course you will have to add more fields, you will have to add more Lagrangian terms, maybe more mixings, but that's it. It's just a repetition of the same technique. And there are many models already implemented in SARA, so my recommendation is that every time you want to implement a model, you first check, just in case there is some model that is similar, that is already implemented, because in that case, you can save your time, and even better, you can make sure that you don't make a mistake by implementing something incorrectly. You can get inspired by seeing, by seeing how this has been implemented before. Okay, I will close this file, and now let me show you also... Uh, we have again a parameters.m file and a particles.m file. Uh, they are again very similar to the ones we had in the standard model along in the scotogenic model with just a few additions, very few additions. Since there are some additions which are somehow relevant, let me pay attention to some additions in the particles.m file because these are actually important. Okay, so let me show you a couple of things. First, you can see that now HH, when you compare this HH to what we had in the scotogenic model, now we have two families here. So we have to give a PDG code to both families. To the first one, we decided to use 25, which is the standard model, the, the standard way to give a PDG code to the, to the Higgs boson. But for the second, we have a second number. And we use 35, which is also the standard for a heavy Higgs boson. The same thing happened for AH. But in this case, we decided to use 0, 0. Why 0 and not a different PDG? Okay. So we have two imaginary components in the, in the scalars, in the neutral scalars, but also you have two Goldstone bosons because one of them will become the longitudinal component of the set boson and the other one will become the longitudinal component of the set prime boson. Therefore, the two imaginary components, even though we have them in the implementation, they are not physical states after all. They will be. They will disappear from the spectrum after a, a symmetry breaking. They will become the masses of the set and the set prime. That's why we can use PDG zero because they don't appear in physical calculations unless you are in some particular gauges, of course, as you know very well. So this is one of the things that I wanted to tell you that now in this case we have to extend the number of families. You have exactly the same thing, for example, for the quarks and for the leptons. So here, you see that we have, for the down quarks, usually you just have 1, 3, 5. 
now we have also seven because there is an additional uh, down quark. There is an additional up quark as well, and there is an additional charged lepton. And there are two additional neutrinos. Okay? Now, I repeat again what I said in the first lecture. All this information, all of it, is completely uh, optional. You don't need to give this information in a first implementation of the model. This is only important if you pass this model to other codes, in particular to MATGRAPH. In MATGRAPH, all particles must have a PDG code. So what we are doing here is to make up a new PDG code for the exotic particles, for the new particles. Okay? But at the level of SARA, this is not relevant. So this is not going to be used in our lectures. It's just for you to know that this may happen, that you will have to maybe extend the number of generations if you want to pass this information to, to MATGRAPH. And, and there was one more thing that I wanted to tell you. Uh, I told you already that we have two Golden bosons, and they both become uh, longitudinal components for the Z and the Z prime bosons, and this is explained here. Okay? So for the Z boson, we are taking the first uh, imaginary component of the neutral guys, and for the Z prime, we are taking the second. This is actually not relevant. Even with two one, you get exactly the same. We are just saying that these two guys get absorbed. This is an information that Sarah needs. Okay? And the rest... Yes. Uh, Clarissa wants to make a question, but she has some problems with her microphone. So ah, okay. Read the, Sorry. The, the question. Uh, she's asking about uh, this PDG.IX below the PDG okay. code of the functions. To be honest, I'm not really sure about what this is. I think this is an alternative PDG coding. Maybe someone knows. I actually don't know. I think this is alternative PDG coding. The one that you really need is this one. Because this is the one MathGraph requires. But this one, I don't know. Maybe some other programs use it. Uh, maybe a specific package needs this. Mm, I will have a look because I actually I think I knew at some point, but I forgot. I think this is some PDG coding that is... Uh, alternative to the one we have here, the standard one, no, let's say, with uh, more complicated numbers, so that's why <laughs> we don't use it very often. Um, but I don't know exactly what is the origin or what codes mm -hmm. use this PDG coding. Okay. And you see that for many cases, this is empty. So it's also, I can't remove it here because I'm not going to use it anywhere. So. Okay, so this is what I wanted to tell you about the different model files. Let me also go to the sphino.m file. So, Avelino, I remind a, you. Just as a reminder, ah, yes. as you as you discussed in the previous lecture, this file is not really relevant, right? So it's not mandatory to edit this file, right? So you can just keep it as it is. Yes, the, exactly. Right. As long as you don't want to connect to other codes, this is completely irrelevant. Okay. So when you when you load the model in Sarah, you will get some warnings because Sarah checks that these files are there and, and checks their content and it will find that, okay, you have some missing generations in the definition of this particle or things like that. But you can just ignore those warnings because within Sarah, this is not relevant. It's okay, only so relevant when you want to connect. Ah, okay, I see. Because in CalCap, I remember that you do need this PDG code and label for the particles and so on. So if you want to connect to this CalCap output or have a CalCap output or MathGraph output, then you do need to include those. Exactly. This is the, the standard case. When you want to create output for CalCap or for MathGraph. Okay. Exactly. Okay. If not, you can just ignore it. Actually, in the first implementation, I recommend you to ignore it. Okay, so let me open this additional file, sphino.m, that is used for the implementation or for the connection between Sarah and Sphino. Okay. And again, it really looks very similar to the one we had uh, for the scotogenic model that we saw yesterday. We will begin by telling uh, Sarah that we are going to produce a Sphino module that is for calculation at the electroweak scale. We don't have any running from very high energies and so on. Then we define a, a block in the input file that is called MIMPAR, 
with the parameters that are just numbers. And there is one thing that I want you to pay attention. I think this is very interesting. This is very powerful. And I think there was a question yesterday about this. I, I don't remember exactly. You see that one of the entries, okay, is the set prime mass. However, the set prime mass is not a Lagrangian parameter. Is as you saw in the slides, the set prime mass is just the product. So it's a combination of parameters. It's two times the gauge coupling and this BEF. So the real parameter would be maybe the BEF and the gauge coupling, but not the set prime mass. However, and the BEF itself is actually not a real parameter in the sense of a Lagrangian parameter, but it's calculated from the minimization of the potential. So one of the interesting things about this file is that you can decide that you don't want to give input for a Lagrangian parameter, but for a derived parameter, such as the set prime mass. However, Sarah needs to know the Lagrangian parameter value, of course, because in the end, it's all calculation with Lagrangian parameters. Um, and in particular, it's Fino needs to know. So this trick is fixed here. So, well, here first, let me finish with this block. You see that we have several labels, several numbers connected to several input values for different parameters. Okay? And then next, in this part, we connect the Lagrangian parameter to the input parameter. Lagrangian parameter, input parameter. And for many of them, this is just trivial. So, for example, we are saying that this lamp P, which let me go to the main model file so that you see what that means, because maybe you have forgotten. I have forgotten myself, so I'm sure that you have forgotten as well. So this lamp P is this Lagrangian parameter. So in the Lagrangian, you have this quartic coupling with the phi field. So lamp P times minus one half is the Lagrangian parameter. So what you are saying here is that you will give an input value LP input. So please take that input value for lamp P. Very simple. However, you can do more fancy things. You can do things like this line. You can say, okay, I have given input to this parameter and to this parameter, to the set prime mass and to GX. This is here. Okay? The set prime mass and GX. Okay? And here. This connects GX with GX input. What you are saying here is, and from these two values, you can calculate V phi. You see that P5 is basically given by the set prime mass divided by 2 times Gx. Just the formula that I just showed you. Oops, here. Okay, just this formula here. Okay, I think this is very interesting because for... Of course, it doesn't make any difference. You can give input to the BEF and then calculate the set, bosom, the set prime mass using the code. Or you can give an input to the set prime mass and then calculate the BEF with the code and you get exactly the same result for everything. However, maybe you are interested in running a scan, in running a scan for a plot, for a paper, and in that paper, it looks nicer to have uh, along the x-axis, for example, the mass of a particle rather than the bed. So if you can give input to the mass instead of the bed, maybe that's more helpful for you. It simplifies your life a little bit when you want to scan or you want to run uh, some analysis in your, in your work. So I think this is interesting. Also, you can see that for this G1X and GX1, we have decided that they are zero directly. So in the numerical code, not in the analytical code, eh? in the numerical code, they will be zero always. So this is what we said before. You can have anything here, but we decided to set them to zero always. And finally, these lines are exactly the same lines that we had for the other model. The only difference is that now... Yes. About this, the, what you have just explained. Uh, do you have to make some uh, change in the parameters file? Uh, when you do this, uh, uh, define the MZ prime as the input uh, instead of the um, other parameters? Yes and no. So, uh, yesterday when we were playing with the scotogenic model and Sfino, I provided you with a, an example input file, right? That example input file, you can create it from scratch. But actually, um, I didn't show you, but if you look at the Sfino folder that you can create with Sara, when you run make Sfino and you create all the Sfino code, among these files, you also have a file with an example input file. 
everything filled with zeros. So it's just uh, for you to fill with actual numbers. Um, and that input file follows exactly what you define here. So it will have the blocks that you want just by the way you define them in this, in this file. So the answer is yes, your input file has to reflect what you have here. But actually, uh, Isfino will give you a template for that input file with exactly your definitions in, in, in this file, in this Isfino.m file. Okay, all right, all right. Okay. And so before I, I conclude, just let me note that in the list of decay in particles, I have included the set prime. Because I wanted Sarah to calculate the decays of the set prime. Sorry, not Sarah, Isfino to calculate the decays of the set prime. Why? Because it's a new particle and I want to know how it decays. Okay? But I can remove it if I'm not interested. So, okay? uh, I, 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 Avelina, yes. I do have one question. So, let's say that you have a particle which is a dark matter particle. It has a mass. But for some reason, the symmetry that I have behind makes it stable. Okay? Really stable, not long-lived. Do I still have to define a decay width for that dark matter particle or not? Um, you may, but if you do it, you will see that the output file from, from Spino doesn't have any decay, in, decay width. Because it tries to compute the decay width and it finds zero. I know, but is it mandatory? I, the reason I'm asking... No, no, is, no, of course not. No. Okay, because in CalCap... No, no, we requires for you to include a decay width for the particle anyways. Ah, I didn't know that. Yeah, so um, if, if it so has what? a mass, you have to include a decay, uh, a decay width. Anyway, put a parameter and then the decay width is whatever, 2 GV. But then it knows mm -hmm. automatically that it does not decay because of the Lagrangian. Ah, but I you see, have I didn't to know that. Anyways. Okay. The reason I'm asking is because since you... If for, the, for those who want to have an output for CalCap, then you might have to include this anyway. Okay, then what I I guess Sarah would do, if you want to create input for a CalCap, is to, to make such a choice. Way. So to give some random number for that decay width and that's it. Okay. All right. But you don't need to include it here. Uh, All right. Thanks. Okay. Even particles that decay, like the Higgs boson. If you want, you can remove it from here and it just don't, don't, the code would not calculate the decay width. But that doesn't mean that it doesn't decay. It's just that the code is not computing it because you decided not to. Okay, so, and if you decide to calculate the decay width of a particle that doesn't decay, you will get a zero, and that's fine. <laughs> okay, so with this and done, um, so we have gone through all the different files. We have gone through the implementation in, in SARA of this new model. So now, let me go. I will open a new tab. Let me go to this uh, this notebook, run SARA RBS. And let's, let's see what is the result of our implementation. Let's explore the model with, with SARA. Okay. So, again, this is a repetition of what we did in the first lecture. So, first we have to load SARA. Okay, loaded. And then we have to load the model using the same name that we have used for the folder and for the main file of the model. Okay, it goes through all the checks. Now, for example, you can see that it has checked for the anomaly cancellation, including also the new gauge group. And you can see that all anomalies cancel, otherwise we would have a warning message here. Okay, and it's done. Okay, it took 15 seconds. Maybe you remember that with the Scottodenic model it was about 6 seconds. So you see a more complicated model takes a bit longer. Now we can calculate mass matrices. So for example, for the charged leptons, we get this mass matrix. You see that this mass matrix is now times uh, 4 times 4 instead of 3 times 3. And, and this agrees with our expectation. We have now four charge leptons instead of three. You can easily recognize that this part, this block, is nothing but the standard model part. 
Then there is this mass term in the diagonal. This is the Dirac mass term for the heavy, let's say, vector-like uh, leptons. They are heavy for practical calculations, of course. And there is this mixing that is proportional to Vp, this is P5, times lambda L. So this is what I pointed out here about this coupling. So this Yukawa coupling, when this guy gets a bet, V5, will induce a mixing between the standard model leptons and the new vector life leptons. And you see that in the uh, mass matrix here, in the diagonal terms. I can do the same now for the scalars. Now in this model we have two scalars, two real components, and therefore two scalars. And therefore the, the mass matrix will be two times two. And that is what happens. So this is the resulting mass matrix for the scalar sector. Okay, and you can see some terms in the diagonal proportional to some quartic couplings, also MH square for the HH term, for the phi phi we have M phi square and so on. And some mixing that is proportional to this term, lambda H phi, which is a quartic that mixes both, um, H and phi. Okay, so nothing mysterious, but it's very nice that you can get this automatically. And now I could be playing with this for, for ages, but I let you do that because I think it's not very relevant at the moment. But you can print all the mass matrices, you can print all the vertices as we did yesterday, and you will get analytical results which are very nice in my opinion, because some of these results are a bit more complicated than usual, because the model already has a little bit of a complication. And it's nice to get all these results automatically and so quickly. Um, now I'm going to create a Sphenomodule module because I want to do some numerical calculations with this with this code. However, I did it this morning with my laptop and it takes about 10 minutes. I don't want you to be waiting for me 10 minutes, so I will take what I did this morning and I will presume that I just did it, okay? So close your eyes a little bit and pretend that I'm creating this code at the moment. So I have it here, this tests, Sarah, and uh, output, uh, dark VS, Sphino, sorry, I'm using it breaking, Sphino. Okay. So this is the code that I created this morning, just running that command. So you can do that, and there is nothing mysterious, but I just don't want to wait 10 minutes um, for the for the dark VS model, okay? So the next thing that I have to do is I have to copy all these files, and this is what we did yesterday. I have to copy all these files into Sphino and compile them together with the rest of the Sphino code. In that way, we will have uh, a connection between the specific routines with information about the mass matrices, the vertices, and so on, which are very specific for our model, and the general routines for mathematical calculations that are already in Sphino. Okay? So, um, I remind you how to do that in a second, but before I do that, let me go a moment to this folder, input files, and you have here what I just told you a few seconds ago, sorry, a few minutes ago, that you have a, a template for the input file. Let me just open it. But this is what I said. You have a template with everything, just zeros, okay? So this is what I did the first time. I created this template and then I modified it with some, with some numbers. Okay. Also, uh, at this point, uh, before I... No, actually, let me begin compilation because it takes also some minutes and then I will tell you something else. So this is the folder that I want to copy. So let me go back here. No. Yes, here. I will open a new tab. I like to have many tabs. Okay, so I will go to Sphino. Okay. I create, we did this yesterday, we created this scotogenic folder and then we copied the scotogenic code inside. Now I will do the same, but with the new model. So I will create uh, a new folder called DRBS. And then I will copy the contents of the code that I generated with Sarah into that folder. Okay, these are here. Let me find them. It's, uh, Sarah. Output, Darby's, okay, and I copy all of them into Darby's. Okay, and once you have done that, you can compile, and the compilation is make model equal, and now instead of scatogenic, 
This is what we did yesterday. We have to use the name of the new model, RBS. Okay, and then it's compiling. So it's compiling a code that combines the standard part, which is inside Sfino, and the new part, which is in uh, the code that we produce with Sara. And now this is going to take, I think, a few minutes. So it's a good moment for questions. But before you ask me questions, let me show you one thing that somebody asked yesterday. And my terrible memory didn't allow me to tell you correctly what the right answer was. So yesterday, there was a question about how to get analytical expressions for the coefficients of the flavor observables. For example, the coefficients that enter the calculation of mu to gamma. And actually, this is automatically produced when you use the, the command uh, to make the LaTeX file. So you remember that the first day, uh, in the last part of the lecture, we created a LaTeX file that we later compiled into a PDF, and that we did it with, uh, with Sarah. So let me just go to Scotogenic. This is the output that we created with Sarah. And we have several files. In particular, if I go to tech, okay, this is what we did on, on Wednesday. So we compile these tech files and we produce this scotogenic file, this PDF file, with all the vertices and the, all the information about the different couplings and also the tuple equations and so on. And the mass matrices for the different couple, uh, particles and all these nice expressions that we calculated with Sarah. Now, I forgot, and I tell you now, that there is also another folder called Flavor Kit within this folder, this tech folder. If you go to that folder, Flavor Kit, you have all these things, which might be a little bit uh, mysterious to you, but once you play a little bit with Sarah and Flavor Kit, you will easily understand what they mean. So, uh, they correspond to the different contributions to the Flavor Observables that are integrated in SARA thanks to Flavor Kit. For example, Gamma 12 is the, these are photonic penguins. So two leptons, one photon. So let me go inside. And you have, again, take files, and you have a file that you can use. Sorry, this page. You can use to compile the tech file and generate a PDF with the results of the calculation done by Sara and Flavor Kit. When you do that, you get this PDF. And this is what you get. So, well, if you want, let me go to the beginning. So, okay, fine, some references. Okay. Now you have different contributions. You have three level contributions. You have wave normalization contributions and penguin contributions. And you know that mu to gamma, for example, doesn't get contribution on three level. So all the coefficients, if you want to see the definitions, you should go to the manual to see the exact definition. But these are the coefficients that enter the calculations. All the coefficients are zero. Also, the wave contributions, wave normalization contributions are zero. And you only get contributions with penguins as usual. Okay, penguins like this. So this would be charge lepton, charge lepton, and a loop with the two charge leptons and a CP odd scalar. Okay, this is a goldstone actually in this model. Because there are no physical CP odd scalars. And the result is here. This is the result of that calculation. This is what you wanted to see. It's a bit unfortunate that you get the diagram here and the result on the next page because this might be a little bit confusing. But that's how it is, sorry. Uh, maybe you can use the tech file more intelligently so that it appears on the same page. In any case, you see that the expression for the different coefficients are given here, okay? These gammas are the coupling that enter the vertices. For example, this is the coupling between E bar, E, and the CP odd scalar with left-handed component, okay, of the uh, fermions and families IB. So I for the fermions, B for the scalar. Okay, it's a bit lengthy, and all kinds proportional to this I4, I3, I1. These are some loop functions that are defined in the manual. Okay, so this is what you wanted to see yesterday. I think this was one of the questions. You can see all these calculations analytically. This is exactly the same that is in the code, but uh, 
uh, I think this is nicer to see in a PDF file. Okay, so I wanted to tell you this because yesterday when you asked me, I didn't remember that actually you get this automatically when you do the metdex command. Yeah, very, very nice. Good. And uh, we were compiling, I still it didn't finish, but it's about to finish. If you have any other question, I think this is also a good moment. Okay, so we're gonna play now with the Sphino using these particular values for the couplings. Okay, so in this model we have more couplings because it's a bit more complicated than the other one. We have more cortex, lambda, lambda phi, lambda chi. These are cortex couplings in the scalar potential. Also, these are cortex couplings, but in this case, combining more than one uh, type of scalar. Then we have these additional couplings and, and masses. This is the mass for chi, uh, the square mass for the chi field. And this is a tree linear. Uh, unfortunately, yeah, unfortunately, no, fortunately. I have the definition of the scalar potential for the chi field, so this mu corresponds to this trilinear coupling. Okay? You can go to the paper to see, or to the manual that I told you that uh, you can follow for this course, and you can see the definition, the complete definition of all these couplings. In any case, also for the gauge coupling, we are using one. For the set prime man, we are using 40 EV to make sure that this passes all the constraints for, from the LHC. And then also for the vector like quarks and leptons, we use 1 TB, which is more or less okay. Maybe for the quarks it's a little bit low, but it's fine. And, and this is what we are using also for the Yukawa couplings. So we are using 0, 3 times 10 to the minus 3, 3 times 10 to the minus 3 for the quark couplings, and 0, 1, 0 for the lepton couplings. Okay? Okay, finish uh, the compilation. What I have to do now is to copy the input file to this folder. And I can do that easily. I remind you that you can find it in the models file, in the models folder, because I, I provided you with a, with an example. Okay. So let me just open it. Okay, and you can see, let me try to put it here uh, a bit bigger. Okay, so you can see that these parameter values correspond to the ones we have in the slide. Okay, so it's just a translation from the slide to the input values that we use in the input file. Okay, this is the block where we give values to lambda q, and this is the block where we give values to lambda l. Okay, um, these are the options, as usual. Now, uh, we are going to set, I will make it bigger to make it more easily readable. Uh, we are going to set this entry over here, 57 to 0, meaning that we do not want to calculate uh, left on flavor violation and quart flavor violation observables just to save time. It's not that long, maybe it's a, a few more seconds, but okay. I decided to set it to zero, and the rest is similar to the one we had for the photogenic model, so there is nothing mysterious. Okay, again, I remind you something very important. All the mentionful quantities in this file have to be given in giga electron volts. Okay, so for example, we decided to give a mass to the set prime of 40 EV, so this has to be 4000 GeV. Okay, remember always, the unit in, in SARA and Sphino is always giga electron volts. Okay, and once we have this file, we can just run the code, because we compiled already. So we run the code. Okay, and it's done. So we have created this additional file, which is the output file of our running. Let me open it. Oh, let's see. Let's see what are the masses, what are the observables in this particular parameter point. Okay, again, the beginning is just a repetition of the input file for you to see what you did. You see, for example, things like this. Remember that we set these two of the diagonal couplings to zero. Otherwise, they would be here, and, and you would see their values. Um, 
Okay, so this is information about the Yukawas, the new Yukawas also, the standard model Yukawas, and then you get to this block, which is one of the most important ones. So you have the spectrum. You have matches for the for the new Higgses and for the for the old one, let's say, for the standard model Higgs. So this is the standard model Higgs with a mass of about 125 giga electron volt, and then this is a heavy Higgs, which is, as you can see, quite a bit heavier, about 632 giga electron volts. This is what we get from the parameter that we use in the input values. Then you have the set boson, a set prime, with a mass exactly of 40 eV, because this is what we decided to use as input. Also, chi, which is this dark matter candidate, it has a mass in this parameter point of about 1.7 TeV. And then you have all the additional fermions. So the standard model fermions, these are the three down quarks plus an additional quark with a mass a little bit above 1 TeV. This is actually is not a numerical error. This is because the mixing with the standard model fermions uh, has a little effect on the mass of the mass eigenstate. Okay, this is uh, as expected also, this is normal. The same for the up quarks. And also, you have also a, uh, sorry, here, a new charge lepton. With a mass, which in this case is actually much heavier. Finally, you have the neutrinos. And for the neutrinos, you have three guys which are massless. In this model, these are completely massless. And two guys which are heavy. And these are the ones coming from the vector-like uh, lepton pairs. Okay, and that's all about masses. Then you have some mixing matrices. You have mixing in the scalar sector. You see that the scalar sector has a mixing which is exactly diagonal, 1, 0, 0, 1. This is because for our parameter point, we decided lambda uh, here, lambda H5 to be equal to 0. And you saw that the only uh, lambda that enters the diagonal entry in the mass matrix for the scalars is this one. So if this one is zero, the mixing is zero. And therefore, the mixing matrix has to be the, the identity. Okay, we have the mixings in the uh, in the quarks, in the down quarks, left and right, in the up quarks, left and right, charged leptons, then the neutral fermions as well. These are given in this UV matrix, and so on. Uh, these are also some options for the record. Some results for the Higgs boson couplings. Then, as I told you, we decided not to calculate in this point uh, the flavor of observables, and I did it on purpose because I wanted you to see that in this case you get these zeros. This doesn't mean that these are zero. This just means that they were not calculated. Maybe this is a little confusing the first time you see it. You may think that this is zero, but this is not zero, of course. It's just not calculated. Okay, and the same here. So, mu to gamma, tau e gamma, all these things were not calculated in this parameter point. Some of them might be zero because lepton flavor is actually conserved in this model. But for example, uh, all these guys are not zero actually in this in this parameter point because there is mixing in the core sector. It's just that they were not calculated. Now some coefficients, which are again uh, not included because we decided not to calculate them. Okay, And the decays. This is also interesting. So again, we have the decays for the different particles. And I was particularly interested in the decays of the set prime. So let me just go find it. The set prime is uh, here. So these are the decays for the set prime boson for this parameter point. So the main decay channel, let me find it. Okay, there are two. So the set prime decays around 40% of the times to down quark, down quark bar of the fourth family, so the heavy one. And Oh, no, sorry, here, more or less the same times to upward, upward bar of the full family. So this would be set prime to uh, heavy top, if you want, or additional full family top and, and its conjugates. And that basically constitutes 80% of the time the set, the, the set prime boson decays. There are other decays which are more or less relevant, like this or like this here, okay, but you see that they only correspond to around 3-4% of the times. Of the times, they uh, 
Yeah, the villain. I have a question. Mm-hmm. Uh, in some models, uh, when oh, your clues are massive, let's uh, say a, a seesaw model, for instance, uh, sometimes when you uh, see the masses of the neutrinos, they are zero, even though they should not be zero. Uh, and only when you enable flag, uh, when you uh, define uh, for the starter calculate the look corrected masses, these uh, neutrino masses suddenly uh, uh, are different from zero. So, uh, are you aware of this? Is this a bug? Is this a, a Yes, so there are two things. One thing is that did did he get offline? Hello? Hello, everyone. So you probably remember that I said that I was gonna uh, switch off the calculation of the low energy cal uh, observables, the flavor observables. Avelino, so for some know. reason that I, I don't really know. Avelino, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Okay. So I think some of the other guys went offline. Uh, let me see. Tessu, can you hear me? Okay, anyway, yeah. I'm recording. I think they're, they're fine. Ah, okay, okay. Okay, right. okay well, in any case, I'm about to finish, so I don't think they're going to miss <laughs> too much. But what I was saying is that uh, what you just pointed out, uh, what our colleague pointed out, is that um, it is true that sometimes the calculation of the uh, neutrino masses are switched off when you switch off the calculation of the flavor uh, observables. This is a bug. This is a bug. I don't know the, its origin. Uh, but for some reason, in the calculation of the flavor observables, there is a last part of the calculation where neutrino masses are recalculated. And that's why sometimes we're playing with this flag that, in principle, shouldn't have any relation to the neutrino mass calculation, changes the fact that neutrino masses appear or not in the, in the output file. And th this is a known a num bug. So, I hope this is fixed in the next versions. Okay, any other comment or question? No. Okay, so, well, that's what I wanted to tell you today in the last lecture. So, I just had this final slide to say that, well, first of all, that I enjoyed very much uh, talking about these tools with you. I think they are very useful, in particular because there are many uh, tasks that you can do on a daily basis that once you have learned how to do them, you can improve a lot your uh, efficiency by automatizing them using these computer tools. And I think that's uh, particularly important nowadays when there are so many models around with so many complicated things to do all of them. Uh, however, there are two things that I wanted to repeat. First, I hope I convinced you that these codes are not hard to use. They are actually pretty easy to use. Of course, depending on the model you have in mind, it may be more tricky to implement it or not. Uh, but basically, the steps are always the same. Them, in some cases, um, can be actually implemented very quickly because they are very close to the standard model or very close to a model that is already in place. So you should not be afraid to use these codes. You will immediately learn. And second, and I think this is even more important, even though it seems like you can just implement the, co the model and then run the code and get a result, you should always understand what you're doing. Because as uh, several questions already pointed out, there are in cases, uh, there are some cases in which these codes have bugs. And therefore, maybe you get a result that is completely wrong and you should not trust blindly in the results of a code. You should always understand what you're doing by getting an estimate or by running uh, a calculation by hand. Uh, okay, uh, that allows you to get a quick result, more or less, to understand what is the expected number that you should get in the output file. 
And if those numbers disagree, you should try to understand whether you were wrong or the code is wrong. And the second part could be also true. Maybe the code is wrong. So these are the two messages I wanted to convey to conclude my, my lectures. And again, thank you very much for the invitation. I really enjoyed being with you. Um, of course, I'm open for more questions now if you want. Or if you have a question in the next few days or any time in the future, just you can ask me and I'm open to discuss any of the things that you can have in mind. And I'm also open to learn from your questions because I'm pretty sure that you will have many good questions. That's it. So, uh, okay, uh, just uh, before we finish, uh, I, I have one more question that occurred to me now. Uh, why did you have to define explicitly the Z2 symmetry? Uh, ah, very, very good question, very good question. Um, this is a very good question indeed. So, uh, in this model, uh, let me go to the slide to make it more uh, visual. So in this model, the Z2 is actually uh, not part of the initial uh, symmetry content of the model. It just appears after symmetry breaking. So you are co completely correct. There is no need to define the Z2. However, uh, if you want to use this program, Sarah, in connection with micromegas, you need to implement the Z2 even though it's redundant. And the reason is that uh, Micromega needs to know which particles belong to the dust sector. So you need to identify these particles already at the level of the implementation. So it's redundant, but it's required if you want to pass this information to Micromegas. So you know that in the Micromegas file, in the calc file that Micromega use to implement the model, uh, there is uh, a clear identification of which particles belong to the dust sector. So SARA needs this set to implement it in the model file in order to create the file for uh, micromegas with this particular identification. Otherwise, it's just, I mean, you, you want the, you need SARA to know physics and uh, no, SARA doesn't know physics. You, you need to provide this information, even though I agree with you, it's redundant. Okay. So do we have uh, additional questions? Just check here if we can. Uh, I think we can finish here. Uh, yeah, I like to add, to I like to add a link. few words. Uh, so, uh -huh. Avelino, as I was saying before, before we conclude that uh, it was really a blast in disguise in the sense, not in the sense that we thought that it would be a bad idea, but in the sense that we knew the difficulties we would face to have these lectures <laughs> online. Because we are, I don't know if you're aware, but in Brazil, many places, and maybe in Europe, you, you having the same problems. The internet connection is very bad and it goes on and off all the time because yeah, sure. of people are at home. So we knew that the difficulties we would face to record everything without running into problems. We know that we have kids at home, for instance, such as myself, <laughs> to have these lectures recorded and, and in a nice way for the, for the others to see later on YouTube. So we knew the difficulties, but at the end it turned out to be a great thing and we are quite happy that we did it. Thank you. So I'm also you. very happy to be with you. Yes. Thank you. Thank you so much. And I actually I do have one uh, a project proposal, but that's something that has nothing to do with the lecture. <laughs> <laughs> but later we can discuss about this. So I'll let sure. us you finish uh, uh, the recording. And thank you again for everything. Thank you. Can finish the uh, Okay, so uh, uh, just before to finish, let me thank you, Avalon. I, <laughs> no, no, I speak on thank you. I speak on behalf of, of all of the students who will, be, will benefit from this course, and uh, the information that you gave to us uh, in a few hours, we 
maybe we'll spend weeks searching for it. <laughs> so many, many thanks. You're welcome. So it was a pleasure. Eh? We got, I got very, very good questions. So actually, congratulations, because some of the questions were actually very good. I, I was surprised. Thank you. And I have given this course many times, eh? so I can tell you that these were very good questions. Okay. <laughs> Let me stop here and okay. So, bye. Okay. Thank you for everything, guys. Thank you. Thank it you. was my bye, bye. Thank you. Bye.